This Week in Pediatric Oncology, the podcast exploring hot topics and exciting advances in childhood cancer. TWIPO is produced by Solving Kids Cancer, nonprofits located in New York and London dedicated to improving research and supporting families because every kid deserves to grow up. Subscribe to TWIPO through your favorite podcast platform. This Week in Pediatric Oncology, the podcast about new advances for childhood cancer. Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 91, recorded on October 29th, 2021. I'm your co-host, Brenda Weigel, from the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm here along with my co-host, Tim Kreip, from Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Hi, Tim. Hey, Brenda. Great to be here again. And today on Twipo, we have a guest, Mariella. Philbin. Dr. Philbin uh, is joining us uh, from the Dana-Farber Boston Children's Hospital. She earned her MD and PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from the University of Graz in Austria. She then came to the United States where she uh, did her residency and fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital and stayed on and has been there ever since um, joining as faculty as a neuro-oncologist in July of 2017. Dr. Philbin has been incredibly successful in the lab in developing a greater understanding of pediatric brain tumors with the goal of finding new targeted therapies. She has really focused her efforts on diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma or DIPG with her current areas of emphasis being understanding and utilizing cell, single cell transcriptomics. And we'll hear more about that to determine the tumor architecture and heterogeneity in brain tumors. She's also exploring what are called downstream effects of epigenetic drivers and potential mutations, which is really the link to the therapeutics in this high area of need in pediatrics. So welcome, Dr. Philbin. We are excited to have you here. We are excited to hear about your work. And, and I want to start off just by asking you if you can just describe for us sort of really what, what is transcriptomics and epigenomics in, in the context of, of, of DIPG and brain tumors? And, and why is it important? Why do we need this understanding? Good morning, first of all, Brenda and Tim. It's a big pleasure to be here with you guys. And we could do this for hours, talk about um, the, the topic I'm dedicating my whole career to. And thank you for asking this great first question. Um, I want to start out by saying I've been in this field for a really long time now. I, um, as you said, I'm from Austria and trained there first before training again. So I started um, research on DFBG 17 years ago, over 17 years ago now. Um, and it's incredible to me how far we have come in our understanding, but also at the same time as a clinician realizing that um, the benefit for our patients has not quite yet occurred to the degree I would want it to. Um, and so that's what my whole goal is. And I basically want to use any new technology out there that can help us understand this tumor better, because I truly think that understanding it well first and then deriving treatments that are targeting this understanding, I hope that's the way to go. Um, and starting now with your question with transcriptomics, um, when I first started in this field, we didn't even biopsy these tumors. They were um, diagnosed by MRI or by CAT scan. And one of my first patients at home in Austria um, in medical school, that was about the extent to what we could do back then. It was diagnosed on an MRI and then Patients and the famous were told that there's nothing we can do. We can give them radiation, but it won't prolong life for long. And that's, that was about it. And it was horrifying to me as a you know, young medical student and still to the day as an oncologist to have to tell families that, um, that we have advanced so much in so many areas, but not in this one. And why is that? One of the reasons, like I said, is we didn't biopsy it. We didn't have tissue to look at you know, under the microscope or more into detail in the genetics. And we also didn't have models. We didn't have, what I mean by that is models, um, cell lines, for example, that we can then use drugs to test in the lab. We didn't have mouse models to, to try. 
just a very vastly understudied field until a few very brave teams then around the world started doing biopsies in these tumors. Why was it done so late? It's because these tumors occur in the pons of the brain, which is a vital, and to say the least, a, a very, very important um, structure of the brain. Everything that comes out of the brain goes through the pons to get into the body, and everything from the body comes through the pons to get into the brain. So it's a major traffic control and also controls some of the most important features of our bodies, like heart rate and breathing rate. So you can't just cut it out. That would be deadly. Um, but a few brave neurosurgeons and neuro-oncologists together as a team started biopsying those tiny, tiny needle biopsies because they didn't want to, you know, take out too much. And for the first time then in 2007, 8, 9, 10, when people started doing that, we had samples available from those patients. And then we started sequencing. And a lot of papers came out in 2012 simultaneously, how it often is, right? Nothing happens. And then all of a sudden... <laughs> Um, groups converge and describe for the first time that most of the BFHEs have the same exact mutation, and that's called histone mutation, K27M, that has never been described before in any other tumor. So that was the first step. We knew the mutation, but it's undruggable. Why is it undruggable? Because it's in a, it's in a gene that's needed for every single cell of the body. It's that gene basically determines how the genetic information in the cell is wrapped up. So you can imagine the genetic information being a long, long string, and it's wrapped around little egg-like structures called histones. And those egg-like structures or spools, that's where the mutation is. So we didn't, we knew we couldn't drug it. So it was exciting to find something, but then not exciting to not being able to move forward for patients. And that's when we then moved to transcriptomics. So it was a long way of coming to your transcriptomics question. <laughs> I, appreciate, I appreciate the background um, that you provided because I think it set the stage for getting to the yes. answer to what is transcriptomics and why do we, why should we think it's important? So thank exactly. you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so transcriptomics is then the output of a cell. So the genetic information in each cell of the body is stored in the DNA that's wrapped around these little eggs. The way it's wrapped is called epigenomics. So is it loose? That means the genes are, can be active or is it wrapped super tightly and nothing can be done you know, for this gene to be active. And then the output of the DNA, that's what transcriptomics is. The output is called mRNA and it's a, the genes in the cell that at that time, that moment in time are active. It's called transcribed, and that's what makes a cell a cell, because the DNA is the same from the you know hair cell to your little toe cell, but clearly the way the cells look are really like different in the end. So that's what trans transcriptomics is, and we wanted to do it first on the tumor level, like take a tumor piece, the tiny one piece I told you about, grind it up as strange as that sounds, and then measure all the transcripts, the transcriptomics of the whole mashed up tumor. We learned a little bit from that. However, an under, a new understanding came about when I was doing that, which was, might it be that the tumor cells within the tumor are not all the same? And if that's the case, and there's a mixture of different kinds of tumor cells and also normal cells, would we lose all this information by mashing it up and just measuring that soup of genes, so to say? And that's then when single cell transcriptomics came up and I, I was a young fellow back then. Um, I was sent to MIT across the river by my um, boss in hematology oncology, Dr. David Williams, who was my fellowship director and said, Marilla, you should really check out new technology. I hear there's something cool going on at MIT. Just go and see what they're doing. And so he sent me over there and I, I met with a few engineers who had just come up, genetic engineers had just come up with this new technology called single cell transcriptomics where, I mean, it sounds, it sounded crazy at the time, it still does to some degree, where it can take single cells within the tumor, each one, and separately look at the transcripts only in that cell. And by doing that, you get a sense of who is there, like what kind of cells, but also what are they doing? Are some of them growing, proliferating actively? Are some of them just hanging out? And who is talking to each other? 
So that was the huge, and I think one of the, the biggest excitement in the whole field of, of cancer, I think, to, to get this new lens um, at looking at tumors. Marielle, thank you for all those. Actually, you're very good at explaining things, so we appreciate that. So uh, single cell transcriptomics is relatively new, right? What year was this when you started learning it and applying it? And how much further has the technology come since then? And and how much computing power does it take to analyze it, all that sort of thing? Yeah, those are great questions too. So I I joined MIT in 2013, and the technology had been developed around 2010. First, you know, it was developed, and then it's always applied to like cell cultures, for example, or or mouse brains, etc. At the time when I joined, it was just prime time for now we can use it for tumors. And our our studies with my my prior mentors were the first ones to look at first adult brain tumors because we had more of them, like more samples, like bigger samples, more samples. And then once we learned the technology and refined it, then I applied it to pediatric brain tumors. And um, thinking about the scale, it's funny now looking back, it's doesn't feel that long ago, but I guess it's you know, 10 years ago now. We had initially a few dozens of cells that we profiled, like 50, you know, if we had 100, we were already super excited. And the technology has changed to now tens of thousands. So with a huge adv like advances in getting the technology better, new ways of doing single cell transcriptomics and the computational power that you said um, has like vastly improved and is improving still. So now we're looking at for glioblastoma, for example, I'm, on a, I'm in a group that studies glioblastoma in adults and kids. Um, we have almost a million cells, like single cells from patients across different ages and comparing them. So it has changed quite a bit. Yeah, that's fantastic. So um, when you look at each of these cells, are, how are you able to identify what type of cell it is and what it's doing and all that sort of thing? How, what's the interpretation like? Yeah, that's also a great question because you would think that that might not be so hard, but it is. So in, in cancer, we're lucky in a way that most cancer cells identify themselves by having copy number variations. The chromosomes are messed up and we can measure that because um, messed up chromosome might be a chromosome is all of a sudden three instead of one or completely lost like zero. And because a whole arm of a chromosome or the whole chromosome is lost or gained, we can measure that on the transcript level. Either those genes are all many, many more than they should be, and then we can call it a gain or loss at all. Like that, those genes on that chromosome arm are not, none of them is, is there. And then we call it a loss. So that's one way. And then we can also look at the mutation. So actually the histone mutation I was talking about before is transcribed and we can measure that transcript. The product of the, of the mutation itself, we can see in the cells. So that's how we see normal cells from cancer cells. Then in the normal cells, we were lucky that the, the normal brain development scientists came a little bit before us, like I said, they had done some single cell work in mice already and normal mouse brains. And as I was developing this technology for pediatric brain tumors, more and more studies actually came out about the normal brain, more in, in a more different areas of the normal brain in mice and now also human. So this is also an exploding field, a normal development of the brain. And then we basically take the cancer cells and the normal cells we find in the tumors and compare it to what has been published on normal cells. And then we give it a name if it matches 100%, which is oftentimes the case. Sometimes we find cells that haven't been named yet. We find cells that are similar to something, but it doesn't have a name because this is emerging as we speak also for normal development. And with that information, I think getting back to sort of uh, where Tim was saying, how do you how do you analyze that? How do you know what what questions to ask or where to go with all that data? As you said, you've got you know hundreds of thousands of of cells and information, and how do you how do you manage that and and decide how to move forward in your work? Yeah, that's a great question too. So we started with only 50, 70 cells, so then it was easy. We would look literally at lists of genes in a particular cell. Once we had a few hundred, it was no longer possible, but then we had the great honor to work with um, the Broad Institute where there were computational scientists doing just that, like developing methods to analyze the single cell data. And right now in my own lab here on the Dana-Farber side, I have three computational scientists who are specializing or specialized in exactly right that, looking at 
hundreds of transcripts of tumor cells, giving them a name, and then we try to find interesting biology in it. And one of the most interesting things we found early on and are now seeing across all different brain tumors in pediatrics and adults is that the tumor cells are really not the same. And what I mean by that is there's always stem cell-like uh, cells in there. So those are cells that look like almost embryonal brain cells that should no longer be in you know, the brain of a child or an adolescent or adult. And they are dividing. They are, we can tell from their signature, from the transcripts, that they're actively dividing. But then they give rise to tumor cells that have the mutation and have the chromosome problems but still kind of want to do a good job and want to get towards what they were supposed to do, which is to become a normal cell in the brain. For example, an astrocyte or an oligodendrocyte or even a neuron. Those are the three most common cells in the brain. So we can see that trying to become somebody more mature with a job in the tumors, <laughs> but they have a block. So most cells, depending on the tumor type, can't figure out how to get there. Because once they get there, they exit, they stop dividing and pretend to be normal, even though they're tumor cells. So that cool, we call it hierarchy or architecture, we have been, um, we first noticed in DLPG and now we're seeing in many other pediatric brain tumors. And I think that's the first um, excitement now where we can try to target because the, the good guys, the ones that are trying to exit the cell cycle and just stay there and not divide, we probably don't have to target unless they go back and become bad again. But can we now find treatments that target those dividing stem cell-like guys and sparing hopefully the normal brain because hopefully the normal brain shouldn't have cells like that anymore. Yeah, I think we wanna get to the targeting of those soon, but uh, tell us about the normal cell composition in these tumors, because we now understand lots of tumors have infiltration of normal types of cells, immune cells, others, and they're playing a role in the tumor genesis. Yes. What have you found with the normal ones? Yeah, that's also a fantastic question. And I think even more where the field is like, that's more even the cutting edge right now, because initially we were so focused on the tumor cells that we sequenced the normal cells too in an unbiased way, which is sequenced any cell that was there, but didn't really take a look at them so much at first. It sounds silly now looking back. And just in the last few years, we started to say like, okay, so who is actually there? Well, who are the normal cells and how are they, how might they be contributing? Like you were saying. So what this is just starting, basically, we first started at, um, with immune cells and found out that brain tumors are really cold, which is a term that um, describes that there are few immune cells from the body within the tumor trying to fight it. And we're trying to find out why that is, like what the tumor cells do to keep the you know, immune cells away. But then most recently also um, looking at normal neurons and how they interact with the cancer cells. There's been amazing work from several groups around the world. Also, Michelle Monte um, from Stanford has been one of the major figures that showed that normal neurons signal electrically and chemically onto cancer cells, and by doing that, make them grow faster. And now we're just starting to learn that astrocytes, normal astrocytes might have a role, and normal oligodendrocytes are there. They're all talking. You can imagine like a bustling city of you know, populations talking to each other, um, mostly helping the tumor grow, which is really a bummer, but that's what I think we now have to block. That's the next step. Why, why would these normal cells want to do that? It sounds that, crazy. <laughs> that sounds crazy. And I think it's based on normal development because in normal development, neurons signal on stem cells to make them proliferate during certain times. And those tumors just have figured out a way, like hijacked normal developmental pathways. And that's what they use to their own advantage. Are there going to be vulnerabilities in those normal cells then that can be targeted in addition to vulnerabilities in the tumor cells? Yeah, I hope so, but it's a little bit more tricky on the normal cell side. Like I told you before that the tumor cells are, you know, stem cells that, we, that are probably not normally there anymore in the brain of a, of a child. So we, if we target that, the toxicities hopefully are not that bad. But if you target normal cells, like neurons, if you target neuron interactions, that's um, a little bit more tricky. And so we and others are looking into what are the differences now? Are there special ways of signaling that are different from um, what goes on in the normal brain that we can then target? But a little bit more tricky, I agree. And do you use this information that you've learned about, you know, the normal cells sending signals to the cancer cells and, and these growth signals? 
is that information then used to model experiments in the lab where you actually grow the cells? Really, I'm asking, how do you use this information to take the next step to say, how do you then, if you're blocking that interaction or you're blocking some signal within the cancer cell, how do you, how do you take that next step? That's also a fantastic question that we are thinking about a lot because like in any other cancer type, we use those cell cultures, like, it, you know, a growth of a tumor in a, in a dish or where we test our drugs. That's the classical way of doing it. But then realizing that often that cannot be or is not, be, is not um, easy to translate into a real human then. And why is it? Is that we're missing some of those normal, normal cells around it. So one way to do it is to have um, uh, co-cultures where we add normal neurons, for example, to the cancer cells and then grow them together do then, you know, drugs behave differently on the tumor cells. Another way to do it is, of course, in mice, and people have done this for a long time, where we inject patient tumor cells into mouse brains, immunocompromised mouse brains, um, that would then grow into a tumor and have interactions, of course, but it's, of course, a mouse brain. So it's human cells, tumor cells, but normal mouse cells. So that's also um, a downside. And, and that's probably true for all the models. Each model has upsides and downsides. One thing we're moving to now is something called brain organoids, which is a new way of growing mini brains from normal reprogrammed um, stem cells and then adding the human tumor cells to this normal human mini brain. Sounds kind of crazy a little bit and it is in a way um, because it's not a real brain, of course, it's in a dish but it's human. So can we then replicate a little bit more of what's going on in the, in the real patient before uh, bringing it back to the clinic? Sounds like um, uh, uh, I'm suddenly blanked on the name of the- uh, Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Halloween, Halloween uh, is a, yeah, <laughs> good time yeah. to be Frankenstein. We're right before Halloween, so that fits. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's really a stepwise process, which is it, that you really have to get this information, really understand the cells, understand the interactions in the cells, and then try to model it. Um, and, and that takes you to that potential for, for developing therapies and gets you get closer to the, to the, the patient. Um, what do you think is the most exciting thing on the horizon and and on the flip side what is the biggest challenge of translating this type of work to to the clinic yeah um also great questions the biggest I start with the challenge the biggest challenge in the past was how can we do um clinical trials for rare tumors efficiently most efficiently and i think that challenge has partly been overcome by collaborations that are now, I think, more occurring than in the past. The community is very close where all the investigators know each other and also the parents and families know each other oftentimes. So they find each other on social media and now there's new efforts of having patient navigators help new families navigate this complex um, system of who has which clinical trial. Um, and I think that's that's what we are doing now, realizing that we have to work together and we need to test more than one idea at the time because most likely no single therapy, whatever it is, can really get us to the cure and cure is what we want. So there's multiple different efforts now. One effort is immune therapies, um, overcoming or trying to overcome the fact that there are not many normal you know, immune cells in the brain tumor for some reason, this cold environment I was talking about before. So overcoming that with all kinds of things like CAR T cells, oncolytic viruses, vaccines. So there's multiple um, efforts on that side. And then inhibiting the communication within the brain between the tumor cells and the normal cells is a big axis. And then lastly, going back to the diving down into the nucleus of the cell, the epigenomics. We know that those histone mutations that I had talked about earlier drive this aberrant developmental cell growth. So can we now inhibit, if not the histone mutation itself, but can we inhibit the downstream effects of what that does in the, in the nucleus? And that's what, the, that's what we call epigenetic therapies. And there's a few exciting you know, things going forward, but um, this field of epigenomic drugs 
is also rather new. So new, new drugs are being designed as we speak. And I'm hoping that in the next five to 10 years, we'll not only have you know, those three classes, for example, one each, but multiple that we can then combine to really, really have an impact in our patients. Are you um, developing some of those drugs or are you dependent on industry to develop them and you're telling them what the targets should be or how are you going about drug development? Yeah, both ways actually. So we are lucky that within the Dana-Farber there um, are several very talented chemists, medicinal chemists, system biology chemists, chemical biologists who make drugs and collaborate with us very closely so we, for example, talk about, you know, I tell them, oh, here are the mutations that we're interested in. Here, I think, are the downstream effects of what that mutation does. Do you happen to have anything that targets this pathway? And then oftentimes it's a hit just by talking. Sometimes they say, like, not yet, but I'd be interested in doing this with you. And sometimes there's also an industry partner who either comes to us or we find them and we find common ground um, by letting, like, them letting us use their drug or us resynthesizing it um, for, for lab purposes if it has already been published and, and the patent is, is available. So there's multiple different ways. Um, in either case, it's always a long road. And I think that's the biggest challenge. Also coming back to the challenge question, we all, we wanna make an impact for the patient today because we're clinicians and today when we face a family, we wanna tell them that, that we have something to offer. And we do have clinical trials today. When I think back about my patient from medical school, at least today I can offer clinical trials, but it just has not yet impacted the survival the way I thought it would, you know, 17 years back, that would be in 2021 or 2022. Um, so it's still a long road to go, but at least more collaborative spirit and new ideas and cracking the stone from the biology and chemical perspective. So DIPG is the one tumor that has the reputation of having many clinical trials tried and the most failed or all have failed. So yeah. um, you're, you're kind of hinting at some hope that we can have that, um, that maybe that'll change soon. Is, is there anything in particular that you're most hopeful for? Or are you just glad that there's lots of potential uh, shots on goal coming up? Yeah, both. I think, you know, a field that didn't see any progress, and you're right, we, we tried, or the we, the royal we, the, the world tried many, many different things, but oftentimes it was based on what drug was available from the company, you know, who was willing to, to do a pediatric trial with, with us on the clinical side, and not so much based on the biology. I think the last few years have opened up trials for, for this particular tumor, what, we, what have we learned, and can we target it? That's more new. And that's why I'm hopeful that soon something will crack the stone. And we have our big neuro-oncology meeting come up um, the week before Thanksgiving this year in Boston. It's the SNOW Conference, Society for Neuro-Oncology. And I'm really hoping for some exciting updates from my colleagues. I'm hearing some through the grapevine. So um, I'm hoping that there will be a few exciting updates. No cure yet. But you know, I'm hoping once we crack the stone a little bit, then we can, we can have a change, something to latch on and then combine or you know, at least overcome resistance, all those things we can then do once we have this first crack. Well, if anything comes out of that meeting that you're really excited about, call us up and we'll get you on another episode. <laughs> <Yes. about> <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I am wondering, given that DIPG is a uniquely pediatric tumor, do you see that the the drug development and a clinical trial will be potentially done only in children with DIPG rather than um, the more prolonged assessment in adults because there really is no equivalent. Do you see that being on the horizon? Yeah, so it's interesting you ask that because um, up to very recently, I truly also thought that these DIPGs only occur in children. However, once we knew that the mutation was driving those tumors, the adult oncologists also started looking if they can see the mutation in the adult tumors and sure enough found it. So I think it occurs in adults, but understudied. And we are just working on a manuscript right now where we compare the pediatric DIPGs to the adult DIPGs, asking like, how can that be if it's a developmental disease? What took it so long in the adult patient so we now have a cohort of, with the youngest patient being two years of age and the oldest one being 68. Wow. Um, 
and looking at the differences and and there are really differences but the 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 main concept is the same the differences seem to come from the microenvironment more than tumor cell intrinsic like from the tumor cell so coming back to the clinical trials you're right that it's sometimes hard to do a pediatric only trial but um, through a lot of advocacy by patient families and a few great people who are just movers and shakers, there is a few acts like the Race Act now in place, and pharma companies have really been more interested in, in working with, with us pediatricians on, on getting their drugs into clinical trials. Well, that's great. And it seems like uh, the future is brighter than the past. So we're- I hope so. To that. That's, so what I think- I hope. that's what I'm working towards. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we could talk about this for hours, as you said, but our time is up. and. I want to thank you for being here and sharing us some of your enthusiasm and your, your ideas and your progress. And it's really exciting time. So good luck with all your work in the future. Thank you very, very much. Really a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Brenda, for co-hosting again. Appreciate it. My pleasure. And thank you, uh, Mariella. It was fantastically exciting and uh, hopeful uh, discussion. So thank you. I need to keep it hopeful for sure. Thanks to the team at Solving Kids Cancer, a nonprofit charity dedicated to improving survival through creating novel treatment options for children. Remember, the more we learn, communicate, share ideas and work together, the faster we'll reach the day when all childhood cancer is preventable or curable. As always, keep up the fight and thanks for listening to This Week in Pediatric Oncology. We welcome your comments, questions or thoughts on topics for future episodes. Just drop us a note at twipo at solvingkidscancer.org. You can follow Dr. Kripe on Twitter at kidsompdoc. Send an email to Dr. Weigel at weige007 at umn.edu. And find all Twipo episodes at solvingkidscancer.org.